and we are live. What's up, everybody? This is Whiskey and Six. I'm Rob. I am here with an individual that I've gotten to know over the last few years through uh, my whiskey endeavors, uh, the owner of Kensington Wine Market, Andrew. Andrew, why don't you say hello? Hey, Rob, uh, and everybody on, uh, I guess this is YouTube, right? Yeah, this is YouTube. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have about nine people in, and people will trickle in and out uh, as we go. But uh, today we're focusing on something that I feel uh, you do an excellent job at. And it's something that I would like to dip my, like, my toes into later on, or at least in the near future. Um, it's picking casks. And uh, KWM, your store has been doing an incredible job. And a lot of these guys that don't even shop in Alberta or don't shop in Canada at all uh, have heard of you because I've reviewed probably dozens of, or well, at least quite a few of your uh, barrel picks. So really happy to have you on and, and get some insight as to the stuff that you've been doing at KWM. And, and we have a tealing 15 um, year old Armagnac cask here. Yeah. 58.4%. Uh, we have a Gordon McPhail, which I think a lot of people will be a big fan of. Uh, I, all three of these people will be a big fan of, but this is a 22 year old Gordon McPhail, 58% um, Mortlock. Mm -hmm. And then we have over here on my left, the Ben Rines 11 year old. I, I don't know if I pronounced that right. I think I did. Uh, yeah, it's Ben, it's Ben Rennes. It like a lot of Scottish distilleries, unless you've heard someone say it, you just you don't know, right? Yeah, exactly. um, and it's this is not a common distillery, and I would add it's not a distillery I would normally get excited about. Right. Well, I had a chance to nose this. I just opened this one. I, I opened the other two uh, a couple of days ago, um, or at least a day ago. But um, the the amount of fruit that I got out of the Ben Rennes is unbelievable. Yeah, and I mean, it's a good example of something where we had our biases, and when we saw the sample that the the, the rep brought by us, and we we're just thinking, oh, you know, I can't think of times when Ben Rennes was really exciting, and I even told the rep somewhat arrogantly, well, it's not likely we're going to pick it because I've never really been blown away by Ben Rennes, and then to its credit, this sample kind of stopped us in our tracks because I, I'm not going to say this is the best whiskey we've ever bottled as a business, but it's very good and it's very good value. Yeah. Um, I was going to say the price is right. And what you're getting 11 year old scotch, uh, mm -hmm. cast train, single cask. This is a single cask as well, or yeah, single cask. Um, and it's, it, it's actually a bit unusual. So this is um, old malt cask, which is one of Hunter Lang's independent bottling lines. They do several others like first editions, which, and I've actually, I, I don't have the right Mortlick with me tonight. I've actually got a, another cask we did, a first edition's Mortlick, that again is a cask that we would not normally ever bottle. It's a wine cask. I, I'm a big wine cask skeptic. However, when it's done right, um, it can be exceptional. And that one comes across like a sherry bomb, not like a wine cask. But the Ben Rennes, um, typically old malt cask bottled uh, their range at 50%. This is a true cask strength though. They bottled it at 56.9 mm -hmm. and, or sorry, 56.0. It's just, it's a distillery that's kind of nondescript to me. Like a lot of distilleries have a profile, they have a style and Ben Rennes doesn't really fall into that category. And I've had lots of Ben Rennes over the years, but most of it's been very middling, very average, not exciting. And I think what stood out to us about this is this was incredibly fruity. It had a softness that was well beyond what you'd expect from an 11 year old. Um, and we just, we, we fell in love with it. It's barley forward. I mean, it's, a, it's not an older whiskey. You'd expect to get lots of barley there, but incredibly fruity on the nose, soft, decadent. And yeah, we, we tried it and we had to eat a bit of humble pie there. And tell Lee, yeah. who's our rep, that you know what? Actually, we will take the Ben Rennes. Yeah, you know what? It I, that was my first taste of it, and I'm like very surprised at how nice that is. Uh, like, just like it's described on the bottle, 
I remember reading orange and chocolate and you get all of that. And there's like, even maybe like a hint of almost like not quite coffee, but somewhere between like a cocoa coffee finish. Um, really, really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how, how do these things occur? Do the, do the reps come to you? I know that you've spent some time in Scotland going to make picks as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, like, with these ones in particular, I guess we can speak to these ones in particular for now, and then yeah. and then you can tell us a Scotland story, maybe or or sure. Um, to be honest, the casks and and I know this was a question you asked about. It's something we're very well known for. I mean, we anyone who's been to Calgary and been to my shop, and actually I saw Watchman's on uh, on the feed there. I know he's based here in Calgary, and mm -hmm. I've seen a, a lot of familiar names there, and I know many of these people have popped into the shop from time to time. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's been there can attest that it's not a very big shop and a lot of businesses, much larger ones than ours, some of the chains and bigger stores also do single casks. But the difference for ours is we're incredibly picky and we're incredibly picky for reasons that are different than a lot of those big guys. Uh, when it started, it wasn't my business. I've owned it for about seven years now, but originally I was making bets on casks with someone else's money. And if they did well, I would get paid, I would get a, a bonus out of it. And so I was always very cautious. And I mean, there were some big gambles we made. Like we bought a 1972 Glendronic back in the day. It was a 39 year old. Wow. And like, I'd lost sleep over that. I thought, oh my God, that I've committed almost $200,000 of my boss's money to this project. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be in trouble. And it, it was really born out of that. In the early days when we were picking casks, some of them would be things that I'd, I'd be offered because I went and paid homage at the distillery or at the bottler. Um, but a lot of times they would send us samples and there were a lot of distilleries and producers where we would reject every single sample they sent us and said, I'm sorry, we don't feel these whiskeys are good enough. And, you know, ultimately it was a financial decision. If the whiskey was not of good enough quality at the right price and I didn't think I could sell it, we wouldn't take it. And it's become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy now in that a lot of the producers are actually pre-screening the samples they send us because they know how picky we are. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the dynamics that's important to know for um, getting barrel samples out of a distillery, especially if they're using like dunnage warehousing, if you're pulling casks to get to the ones on the bottom, you have to remove all the ones on top. And you're talking an hour of hard labor just to get at one particular cask. Yeah. So they know that when we're particular, if they don't find something good for us, then potentially we're going to go back at them and ask them to pull more cask samples. Yeah. And I think that's a great point you made where I think what's unfortunate is in the industry that the people that are making barrel picks, they will settle for the first let's say six sample, one of the first six samples that they're given just because they may not get an opportunity again, or they don't want to disappoint the distillery or, or whatever. And the fact that you guys are screening that well, that's a testament to what we see as the buyer, because I've had, a, I think it was an Amru that you chose that ended up being like a whiskey of the year of mine. And there was like there was a whole bunch of different ones that I really really enjoyed that you, that you've done so far. So I mean the quality is clearly there. Uh, mm -hmm. Just quickly, I'm going to uh, Kevin Don says this is where I put down payments on the next KWM barrel picks, right? Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate the super chat, buddy. Um, we have a whole bunch of friends in the chat. I'm just gonna say hello to a whole bunch of people really quick before we continue. Uh, we have John Kranz in the house, uh, P Boss. Watchmen, like you stated earlier, uh, my friend Kevin and uh, Peter White, Cars and Cubes, what's going on, guys? Um, Donald Rance. Well, glad you guys joined us. Big trees in the house as well. There's a whole bunch of Jeff, yeah. Jeff out on Vancouver Island. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's amazing. I, I recognize a lot of these names. So, uh, uh, really cool. Just to kind of finish on that, Rob. Um, we know a lot of our customers and like a lot of the ones who are, who are on your show tonight can't come to the shop and sample the whiskey before they buy it. And I mean, that's something that prior to COVID and now that we're transitioning out of that period, we're going to be really going back to 
one of the things we really pride ourselves on is if we um, are, are selling a, a whiskey or we're, we're romancing a whiskey to someone when they're in the shop, more often than not, there's an opportunity to try it. And uh, we know that people who live in other provinces can't do that. And we don't take for granted the fact that a lot of people buy our casks just because we've put our logo on it or our name on it. And that's something that factors into our decisions too. I mean, I've got um, four great, great staff that work with me on this. Um, Evan and Kurt and Sean have been with me for years. They've all got great palettes and recently Harmony who joined us in the fall. And, you know, when we're looking at these things, this is not a decision that I make on my own. Ultimately, it's my money. So at the end of the day, I'm going to make the final call, but I'm really relying on them. Like, and we talk through it. Can we sell it at this price? And there are times where I go back to the agent and say, look, we love the whiskey, but we just don't think it's going to sell at that price. And sometimes they work with us to make it work. And sometimes it's just something that we have to pass on. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, the cost is definitely increasing across the board. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about the ones that we're talking about tonight is I think they're very well priced. Um, you know, so um, we talked about the Ben Rennes. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this teeling because this is the second cask you guys have done with uh, teeling, you said, right? Yeah. I, I love the teeling guys. I love what they're doing. And when I say teeling, this goes back to Cooley, which is the original distillery that the Teeling family owned. Um, Teeling is owned by um, John and, or, sorry, Jack. It's owned by Jack and Stephen Teeling. They're the sons of John Teeling, who founded Cooley. And uh, when they founded Teeling, after the Teeling family had sold Cooley to Beam Suntory, the family kept a, a shockingly large number of casks. I mean, I would love to have been a fly on the wall of that sale to find out like how on earth did they manage to not only get tens of millions of dollars out of beam, but also manage to keep so many of the casks. But the other thing that they kept was the master distiller at Cooley um, moved over to Teeling Distillery with them. Um, a guy by the name of Alex Chasco, who's a great guy. He's from Oregon, like not what you would expect to be an Irish distiller. And He's got a really old school approach to making whiskey. Um, there's a lot of focus on fermentation. There's a focus on slower distillations. And I think it really comes through in the whiskey. You get this uh, teeling to me when it's good, always has this beautiful tropical fruit character. Uh, and layering on top of that an Armagnac cask where you've got this really big decadent spice coming through on top of it. Um, it was a lot of fun. I, I was lucky about... Uh, Three years ago, just before COVID, I guess two and a half years ago, um, I paid a, my second visit to Teeling and um, Alex drove me all the way up to nearly up to where the border with Northern Ireland is to go to their warehouse. And we went into the warehouse and Teeling has possibly the craziest assortment of casks in their warehouse of any company I know of in the whiskey industry. They've got non-oak types. They've got chestnut, walnut. Um, they've got oak types from all over the world, things that the Scotch Whiskey Association would never allow Scottish producers to do. And we spent an afternoon going through the warehouse. And at one point, I think I had to say, Alex, I'm done. My palate's ruined. Like I, I can't sample another barrel sample, but the stuff they have in there was incredible. Some of it was bad, like really, really bad, but, <laughs> but it's, they're experimenting. They're trying to find things that other people haven't discovered before. And the rules around Irish whiskey allow them to get really creative. That's that's actually um, something that a lot of people say the same for Canadian whiskey, and it's a. I think there are some distilleries that are doing it, but it's. I guess it's a lot younger, uh, in the innovation side of things. And maybe not. Maybe not younger. It just feels like it's younger because it, it hasn't happened historically. Uh, whereas Teeling has all these barrels that are already sitting in warehouses, which is in my opinion, really, really cool. And I, I had an opportunity to meet one of the owners as well in a live, just virtual chat, unfortunately, but a really cool guy. And you could tell that they're doing a lot of, and you could tell it's a passion thing for them as well. They, they really enjoy what they do. Yeah, no, they're, they're great guys. Um, uh, Jack Teeling, who's one of the owners of possibly the one that you would have met. I mean, he's, 
he's you can tell he's he's a he's fun he's like he's it's a business he yeah you want to make money at the end of the day for business mine's no different but i i put a lot of weight in enjoying the journey and having fun and i i would say that a lot of times i prioritize that over the bottom line like when we do tastings and we've done a lot of virtual tastings through covid and we'll continue to do them there are times when we lose money or it doesn't and I, and I don't care because it's a fun experience and we know other people are going to enjoy that ride with us too. So yeah, I have a lot of respect for Teeling. I think their distiller is highly underappreciated. Um, and maybe that's a good thing because people aren't trying to poach them away from Teeling, but uh, <laughs> they're a really, they're a fascinating company and uh, I'm a big fan of what they're doing. Yeah. And this is really nice. Really happy. I grabbed the bottle. Um, I know there was a comment there that I caught from uh, Watchmen saying we need more more Aaron picks. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> we're working on it. I mean, this is probably the biggest challenge right now is the the supply and logistics issues that are starting to to manifest are things we've never felt or seen before, and we've still got a lot. We've got a lot of casks in the pipeline, which is great. But I'm starting to worry now about 2023 because the timelines on a lot of these things keep getting longer. Some of the producers that we've had like really long standing relationships with, like Aaron, we're still waiting to hear back from them on requests we've made for casks. And we'll have to see what happens on that front. Um, but the, the industry is going through some real turmoil right now, not just due to demand, but inability to supply cardboard bottles um, to get in the bottling queue and, and COVID is still playing havoc with this stuff. And it, it might mean that there, you know, there's not quite as many in the years ahead and hopefully that doesn't pan out, but I'm, uh, it is something I've definitely got my eye on. So speaking of specific di distilleries, uh, before we get to the Mortlock, um, mm -hmm. has there ever been an opportunity with Springbank to, to bring in a cask? We actually did two Springbank casks in the late 2000s. Okay. Um, we were really lucky. We had a 96 Oloroso cask and a 96 Manzanilla cask. Wow. And the crazy thing is, I think th they might have done a couple of uh, long rows for um, co-op wine and spirits back in the day too. But very quickly, that those opportunities were shut down. And they were shut down because I think even in the early 2010s, there was a realization at Springbank that they just didn't have the supply to meet demand. Yeah. And what they have been offering, uh, and there's even another one coming, is they've been offering casks for the market. So uh, Andy Dunn, who's the importer of Gold Metal Marketing, will get offered periodically a cask. The problem there, as with anything Springbank now, is the demand is so dramatically higher than the supply mm -hmm. that the the whole thing is broken like you know when you're in a situation where spring bank 10 and 15 have to be sold by ballot and one out of every five people might get a bottle like i mean to be honest it's every time spring bank announces a new release i get heartburn um, yeah yeah i believe it I, I think that's a common shared feeling now across alberta amongst store owners because they're they're bound i mean it, it's nobody's fault but they're bound to upset yeah. somebody right like somebody's yeah. gonna be upset so or many people will be upset but you know like like the glendronic 72 that we bottled way back in the day i mean that's an iconic year for the distillery or the port ellen 83 that we bottled and i think 2008 i mean those spring banks are kind of legacy bottlings that i look back at because I'm not expecting I'm ever going to get a chance to ball another one. Yeah, uh, I mean, a 16-year-old sherry cask. I, I think I saw in the in the chat. Um, I mean, that was before my time, and that's unfortunate because I wonder if there's any bottles of that floating around, any dusties that people <laughs> decided not to open. I've, you know what? Every once in a while, I'll see one offered up at auction here in Alberta. Um, because I mean, th these were big casks. There were 600 bottles in each, and. Wow. I, I mean, my regret is, you know, at the time, this was early in my career. I didn't have a lot of money. I only kept one of each. So, I mean, that's, I've got one of each to open someday and I am not selling them flat out. Uh, yeah. There's just, because I'm never going to get another. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it's, 
that's pretty much now the Springbank way. I mean, I think the last couple from uh, to Alberta as a whole in like market wise uh, was the Hazelburn 13 bourbon rum cask, rum cask, I think it was. Uh, and then was it a 13 year old or 14 year old, 14 year old, maybe might have been 14. I'd have to look back. I mean, and then it was a long grow 17 Chardonnay before that, mm -hmm. that, that, the, that long row was lovely. And I, I mean, another good example of wine cask when it's good. Um, sorry, I just have to. Oh, yeah. I'll spare, your, I'll spare your viewers the uh, the cough. Uh, we were joking before. COVID finally caught me after two years of yes. exposure to the public about three weeks ago. And it's mostly behind me now, but uh, some, some minor lingering effects. You know, I, there's been some great casks and and i know there's a 20 i think there's a 23 year old long row coming this year but i mean it's going to be a i already told the rep like he, he left me a sample and it's good but i told him i can't get excited about it because i know i'm gonna break way more hearts than i please yeah. with it and that's just the the sad reality of spring bank yeah it's unfortunate and we talk about it all the time on the channel um actually I also had my bout with COVID uh, last week, and I think Jeremy's – he's not confirmed yet because he's still testing negative, but he may be uh, fighting it right now. We're not sure. So, um, But, I mean, we talk about Spring Bank all the time on this channel. It's unfortunate what's happened. I mean, it seems like it happened really, really quickly because three and a half, four years ago, Spring Bank was still relatively available in Alberta. You can get it. Uh, you, yeah. you can get more than one if you really wanted to. Uh, you wouldn't really have to fight too hard to do that. Uh, now it's literally a ballot on everybody's list, and and you gotta get lucky. Yeah. One. Well, I mean, uh, Rob, I think you're a Springbank Society member, right? Yeah. 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 So, and the good news there is, for we have something coming for Springbank Society members that I think we have enough to give everybody a bottle, like if they want it. Mm -hmm. But there used to be a time when even Springbank Society, and even though we had enough members, we'd get a release in and it would be around for a while and people could potentially get a second bottle. And yeah. increasingly, you know, even for that, it, it, and Springbanks closed the society to new members because they just can't, they can't offer the existing members balls. Yeah. <laughs> BB Jab is saying the 28th. Is that is that the one that we're talking about? Uh, I you know it might be I, again I it's something I I sampled the other day it might be a twenty oh yeah the the one in small bottles right Springbank twenty one year but they're in like I think it's hundred mil or two hundred mil bottles oh wow that's the society so that that's why everybody will at least get a chance at it okay because because it's going to be in smaller format bottles but I guess be better that than none at all so yeah. Uh, uh Jasper saying uh, 20 CL, so 200 milliliters. Um, interesting, interesting. So, so that so that's coming. I mean, that's at least one thing to look forward to. And you know, the funny thing is, for for the last couple of years, we've been trying to get people excited about Glen Scotia, um, mainly because we love Glen Scotia, and it's not as well regarded as Springbank, and the style is a little different, but there's some similarities there. And the problem with Glen Scotia is it's a very small distillery too, and this year we we were allocated 15 for the first time. It's yeah. not something that we could just order whenever we wanted. We were and we were given a good allocation for what the market got, but that's it. I'm not sure we're going to see any more this year. Yeah. Yeah. I recently opened the bottle of the 18 and I was pleasantly surprised. I did it head to head with the Spring Bank 18 because I actually liked it a lot more. I thought it was a mm -hmm. lot more I, just more what I was looking for. I, I found the 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 most recent Spring Rank 18 was a little too sulfured for my liking, um, but still good. Just not yeah. my favorite. You know, that is an issue sometimes with Spring Bank. I mean, uh, Kurt, one of my guys at the shop who's been in the, like he, he was a whiskey nerd before he came to work in the industry and really passionate about Spring Bank. And it's something we've talked about where Spring Bank does those sulfur casks do crop up from time to time. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is though, sometimes somehow there's, I and mean, I think it's because spring bank is so inconsistent, which is one of the things I love about it. Yeah. But it's somehow more forgivable than most other distilleries. When, when yeah. I think 
it's a common i think it's has something to do with the funk that like it kind of masks like mm -hmm. what i really dislike about sulfur so i can still tolerate it with spring bank but like other distilleries that don't have that peat or funk i guess you can say uh mm -hmm. although that's probably a very overused word um it, it doesn't matter like deanston i find when they're sulfur they don't mask that sulfur at all in any way shape or form and it can be really off-putting uh, yeah. whereas with Springbank, i'll still drink the old long grow 14 sherry cask or, or mm -hmm. uh you know um the kill karen eight year old of uh 2020 i think or 2021 whichever one was a little bit more sulfur uh and then this 18 year old i still blind buy Springbank every time without trying just because i know that most often you're going to get something really good right so yeah well for me to be honest like my go-to has always been the 15 mm -hmm. and uh especially in the late 2010s so like 2017 2018 we saw a lot of really good batches come through the shop um but yeah that was the problem this time around like i couldn't even let myself take one because there were just it was demand and like there was a 10 to 1 request to bottles ratio so i can imagine I'm sipping away at this one. I poured myself baby pours because I didn't want to get, I wanted to taste each one without like, you know, <laughs> getting a little too, too uh, intoxicated here. Um, I poured myself a nice little baby pour of this one here and I'm really, really enjoying it. So it's a 22 year old Mortlock. I think it's a bourbon cask. First of all, yep. bourbon. Ex bourbon yeah. barrel. And yeah, yeah fresh. I'm, we're quite sure it's fresh bourbon. That really comes through in the profile. Yeah, so it says it says on the bottle, first fill bourbon barrel, um, twenty two years old, fifty eight percent. I mean, it is fantastic. Yeah. I, I think it's great, and it's funny because if this was a sherry cask, it could taste exactly the same, and it would fly off the shelf. If it was like three tinges darker and it said sherry on the bottle instead of bourbon, it would be Rob. Awesome. Rob it could have been a sulfur bomb. A sherried sulfur bomb at the same price and people would have bought it because it was sherried more look yeah. um I, this is probably the best cask we have in shop at the moment um it's decadent it's a tropical fruit bomb like it's just oozing fruit that 58 percent is, is is dangerous like it is so silky for how how high the abv is on that yeah. but a lot of this really goes down to like and i know this is not a typical mort like that's the other thing i should say this is not you know, even with more, like you can say sulfur and it doesn't mean the cask was tainted. It's just that yeah. meaty, heavy profile. Right. But this doesn't really have that. There's a faint tinge of it. Yeah, you this get is, a faint bit of it. Yeah, you're right. But this is just a very clean fruit bomb Mortlick. And most of them are gone. I think we're two thirds sold through it. But you're right. If it was sherried and dark, it would have been gone like within a couple of weeks. Yeah. even if it was bad and uh, i mean that's kind of unfortunate but the reason the quality on this is so good is is who it's bottled by this is gordon mcphail this is not parcels of casks bought on the open market this is wood that they've owned from day one they put brand new new make spirit into their own wood and this is what comes out the other end yeah they honestly uh i don't think there's a bottle that i've had of Gordon McPhail that I didn't like. Um, there's been some that I absolutely loved, but none mm. that I didn't like. Like all good. <clears throat> I've never had a bad Gordon McPhail. So uh, I, I'm sure they exist. I just haven't had them. And right. I, I've had quite a few. There are so few I, and far between. I'll, yeah. I'll agree with you on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know they exist, but this is another one that you have. Um, I, I'm not sure if you have any left, to be honest with oh, you. Oh, God, no. Yeah, that's the Kleinlish. Um, yeah. So that whiskey actually became a bit of a hot potato, um, <laughs> mainly because uh, the commercial director for Gordon McPhail saw my post, which was not in inaccurate. Like we we negotiated the price on it, and we made good money on it. Like we don't, we never want to fleece customers, but we're in business to make money. And um, his comment on my post, which said. This is insanely good value, especially for the quality of the whiskey, which is true. Um, but he looked at that and said, if this was bottled anywhere in Europe, it would have been 50% more expensive. Um, and 
So it, in the end, it became a bit of a hot potato because I was kind of like, ooh, our next few casts are going to cost more. But it was an amazing whiskey and, and we limited it. And that's the other thing. When we have things like this that we know are going to just go out the door, we don't want people to buy six. We don't want we don't want to see them popping up on Scotch whiskey auctions two months later. Yeah. We want as many as many of our regular customers as possible to get a bottle. Yeah. Do you find, and I think this is maybe the best question for you because you've been in it for what I call the Albertan whiskey revolution. Um, and that's within the last, I would say five years. Um, five years ago, I could call pretty much any store in Alberta and they would have exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, within the last three and a half years, that's drastically changed. And it mm -hmm. seems like um, the secondary group of Albertans has grown like bigger than uh, like pretty much anybody on the Facebook chat selling stuff. And, and from what I, my experience so far is, is an Albertan. They, because they have great access to these bottles, they're all over the secondary market. Um, yeah. have you noticed that? Have, have you noticed there's a lot of that now? Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of it. And I can tell you it's not something that I'm happy about. Um, we're not in business to like, you know, sell things to people to get flipped the next day. Now, I should qualify this by saying like people trade all the time. Like um, uh, I, I don't because I don't even have time um, right. to, 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 to figure out what I've what I've bought years ago and forgotten about. But. People, I know people trade whiskeys, so they'll do deals to get something they really want. Right. And I don't have an objection to that, nor do I have an objection in principle to someone if they've got a big collection and they need to downsize for financial reasons or because they're moving into a smaller house or whatever. Yeah. That's all fine. But I, I have a real aversion to people who buy whiskey and then flip it on the internet within 24, 48 hours. And I know there's a lot of people out there that do that. Yep. And to be honest, when we find out who some of those people are, um, when we do ballots and draws for rare bottles, we do our best to make sure that they don't get them. And, and that's because we know these things are limited. And at the end of the day, this is here to be enjoyed. And whether you're going to enjoy it tomorrow or a year from now on a special occasion, it doesn't matter. But you're, you're, you're right. And I think that secondary market has spurned has 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 blown up because they're because of geography there's people in this market that connected with get connected with people elsewhere yep. and they act as a middleman and funnel them i mean we used to hear stories about people buying you know blanton's gold by the case to flip it back to people in the states and yep. all kinds of weird crap like that and yeah it's not something i'm happy about and we 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 do our best to make sure that whiskey gets in the right hands we're not hundred percent because we don't know everything, but we do our best to try and be fair and make sure that people who are actually buying it because they love it and it's their passion that they try to get it. Yeah. And I mean, it, we could, this is a topic that Jeremy and I rant about constantly and we could talk about this all night. Um, it is unfortunate that literally a good amount of the whiskey that's being bought up in Alberta right now is showing up on secondary literally 24 hours later. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, like you said, there's a, bu a bunch of people that are trading to, to trade up or to mm -hmm. downsize their collection to buy to either for financial reasons or to buy something that they've never got to try before kind of thing. Right. Um, so yeah, th there's that side of it that I, I do agree with. Uh, it's the, like you said, the, the guys that are going store to store and then the next day flipping all the bottles that they just bought for double the price. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's become a big problem. I think in Alberta, especially because, yeah. um, you know, there used to be a time where you can, like I said, call a, a, an Alberta store and, and they have what you need, but that's mm -hmm. changed drastically. Right. So, yeah. Well, and you know, one other thing I'd want to add to this, um, if you ever see any of our bottlings on an auction site, I mean, this has happened, like our 25th anniversary compass box. Um, we had an Elements of Isla, Pete and Sherry, and customers were sending me links and saying, look, these are on, 
you know, auction sites in the UK, just to be hundred percent clear, we would never do that. Like that's, um, we're here to sell whiskey to people. We're not back channeling things elsewhere. So if you ever see that, I just want people to know that is not something that we engage in or do. Cause it's, I mean, if that, if, if that ever got traced back to me for my reputation, that'd be horrible. I'm, I'm not in the market to do that. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, and I, I actually, we've commended you on this channel, um, a bunch of times. And it's part of the reason why I invited you on tonight. Uh, and I was hoping Jeremy would be here, but obviously, uh, COVID had other plans or whatever illness he may have at this moment. Um, but we, we like the fact that, you know, you respect, you respect the prices you respect. Um, you're not over inflating just because it's a high spectator bottle or, and, and you know what, the bundle thing I think is a great idea. I think it gives other people the opportunity to buy a bottle that they probably wouldn't have bought if it wasn't part of a bundle. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, you know, um, it's a fair way of you get two whiskeys, but you get a chance to buy this whiskey mm -hmm. or, or whatever. I, that was, mm -hmm. that was great when it, when it lasted, I don't know if it can still continue because of all the uh, demand and stuff like that. But. Um, you know, sometimes we do that. Um, and you know, the reason we're usually pretty transparent about things like that when they happen, you know, everybody wants the limited release, but when, you know, distilleries and, and importers decide who gets what, a lot of times that's based on how much of the core stock are you moving. And so sometimes we bundle things like that to remind people that like, we all know you want the Glendronic 15 or whatever other limited release it is, but we have to sell volume of the core stuff to get that. Um, the one thing that we've started doing in the last year, again, because of COVID new opportunities that we really love is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the things we love doing are these, we've started doing these FOMO tastings where if you really want the bottle, you have a chance, but you have to take part in a tasting. Like, because part of this is whiskey for us is community. And we wanted the people, you know, the people who are willing to engage with us and tune into a tasting and make sarcastic comments, give us funny tasting notes. You know, those are the kind of people that we know are in it because they're in it. It's what they're passionate about and that's what they love. And it's a way of us also slowing things down, slowing that hype down and trying to give people that are really passionate about it a chance to, to buy the bottles. Yeah. And um, so let's, on that note, let's, let's go back to this more lock because I yeah, do, yeah. I do want to talk a little bit about this. Um, so is this like, are you dealing directly with like Richard, for example, um, when when picking these casks, or are you dealing with um, uh, James Bourne, uh, the, the company that it's, represents? It's a it's a bit of both, but I mean, mostly I deal with James because like Richard's got it. Richard's got to deal with people all over the world. He's a busy guy. He travels a ton, and I think ultimately what happens, and sometimes it goes two different directions, but. You know, we'll let James or Richard know what we're interested in. And then those opportunities come through James. James has to price them because he's he's the importer for the product in the market. Um, but in the case with Gordon McPhail, I, a lot of these things start with we've had a long relationship with them um, that go back goes back before Richard to his uncle, Michael Urquhart, who I was lucky to call a friend. And the very first cask of whiskey we ever bottled for Kensington Wine Market was a 1960 Strath Isla in 2016-2017. It was so dark, like you couldn't see through it. It was the color of Coke. And wow. it even shoot, it, it threw an actual shadow um, or left sediment on the glass. Like it was an incredible, incredible whiskey. So I think some of the, op and actually this is really, really the honest truth with some of the opportunities from companies like Gordon McPhail, Compass Box, Aaron, um, is that these are relational opportunities. Um, Elixir Distillers with our single malt to Scotland releases. These are things that, that are coming to us because these are companies that like dealing with us and they value our relationship. Berry Brothers and Red, an, another great one that I got to mention. Um, they're, they're giving us these opportunities because they know we value and respect their brands. And um, sometimes I'm asking for specific things. Sometimes 
you know, Richard or um, uh, Chris Mabin at Elixir or Dougie McIver at Berry Brothers is saying, you know what, I think Andrew's going to like this. And there are opportunities that we wouldn't have known or asked about. I don't know if you ever tried our 40 year old blend that we had from Berries, which was, I mean, it was knockout. It, it tasted like what I imagine 40 year old McAllen tastes like. And I actually think it was almost entirely 40 year old McAllen sherry cask. You know what? I shook my head. No, but I think there's a guy in the chat that allowed me to try that bottle, if I'm not mistaken. And that's uh BB Jap, uh, my buddy Jasper. Jasper. Yeah. I think I know who uh, Jasper Ewan. Yes. I hope yeah. I'm not outing him there, but uh, no, no, that was a knockout balling and it was relative to what the quality of the whiskey was. It was dirt cheap. And that, that was not something that I ever asked for or thought was available. He just said, Hey, I've got something really cool for you for your anniversary. And he wasn't kidding. Yeah, no, that was a, that was a great bottle for sure. And I, I honestly, like it's funny. I think what you guys are doing is the right way to do it because if you don't do it this way, uh, the competition for whiskey is going to just get more and more fierce. Uh, so if you buy casks, you have the opportunity to kind of corner the market um, and exclusively sell something that you don't have to bid on or you don't have to hope that you have an allocation in your connect uh, account or, or whatever mm -hmm. else. Right. So um, I think you guys are doing the right thing to be honest with you. And this, so this Mortlock, this was from this year's or last year. Cause I know that I have some insider <coughs> information. I know that you guys just chose like a bunch of the new batches of Gordon McPhail are coming soon. I'm not going to say who got what or whatever mm -hmm. else, but, but uh, this is from last year, right? Yeah, this was, this arrived um in just like november of 2021 right and we've still got a little bit left and you know relative to the price I i'm not surprised i mean it'll be gone probably in three or four months and that's fine um but a lot of those things were cast that we chose almost a year before they arrived in store and a lot of that has to do with the logistical challenges we're having um we just signed off on a couple of glenn or sorry a couple of gordon mcphail casks for next year i mean i'm not expecting them to arrive until until january or february but we've got a glen scotia cast coming and a, a sherry bell blair so there's some exciting stuff in the pipeline uh for sure yeah um you know uh, part of me is really happy that i gave you the platform to share that and the other part of me is like damn i wish i would have got my bottles first and then, asked, and then let you do that well with a lot of our casks that are coming in now we're trying to be really um we're trying to make sure that they don't again get monopolized. Like we've got a Brooklady cast coming shortly. Our last Brooklady cask sold out in two days, which is mental. Like I don't, I actually, it's as great as that sounds. It's not great. Uh, right. It causes a lot of issues. Um, but like things like that, we, you know, when they come in, we make sure that they're limited to one per person until a reasonable period has passed so that people aren't buying six packs of them. Yeah. Um, we've, we've got a compass box, 30 year old blend or not 30 year old 30th anniversary blend coming. That's got Ardbeg in it. And, um, you know, we know that's going to be in high demand and it's, it's phenomenal. Um, I think, I, I don't know if I, I think I sent you a little sample of, it. I don't know if you've had a chance to try I it. Yet. I haven't uh, actually, I, I was trying to open them earlier today and I was having trouble. Maybe I can open them now. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. But it, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful blend and, we already know demand on it's going to be crazy. So um, there's a decent volume, but that's going to be limited to per person until we've made sure that everybody's had a chance to get at least one. Um, we've got a, a Sherry Glenallachy coming. Uh, we've got an 18 year old Ben, Re ben Romek coming. We've got a Daft Mill cast coming, which is crazy. I've got people direct messaging me in Europe that are desperate to get this Daft Mill and I, it hasn't even arrived yet. Um, so there's some really cool stuff in the pipeline. We've got another Imperial cast coming. I never thought we'd get another Imperial, but the guys at Elixir, they like us. So we've got, there's another one of those in the pipeline. Nice. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the Glen Alkies. I know that there's going to be quite a few dispersed across, uh, Western mm -hmm. Canada, but, uh, really excited about those. Um, the Daft Mill. It's funny because I don't know if the secondary is quite caught up here yet, but 
in Europe, it's absurd. They, they're 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 hitting you up because to get a bottle of Daphnil in in the UK right now is as bad as as uh, Springbank almost. It's it's become yeah. insane. Um, I think what I'll do with the samples is I'll wait till Jeremy's here and we'll share we'll share sure. the samples and yeah, uh, yeah. we'll talk about those. Um, but I'm sure that we'll end up buying bottles because I'm sure they're going to be fantastic. There's a boutique as well. Um, the 20 year old. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just want to tell this story because, um, and before I do, I, I just want to quickly comment on Daft Mill because I know Daft Mill has become a bit of a hot potato for the importer in Alberta because we're the only store that's been given any of it. And this goes back to really about 10 years ago. I heard the story about Daft Mill and Francis Cuthbert and, I, I heard that he was not planning to sell any whiskey until it was 10, 12 years of age. And everything about this guy is just like, oh, man, I want to go meet this guy. And at that time, he did not want visitors. He didn't want people showing up at his distillery. And I think it was the Berry Brothers and Red Guys. I begged them. I'm like, can you connect me with them? Like, I really want to go meet this guy. So I went and I met him and I toured the farm and I chatted with him. And, you know, I kept checking in. For a while. I gave up after a while, but I kept checking in with, with the distillery and with, with Barry Brothers. And then about a year and a half ago, Barry's just connect, uh, contacted me and said, hey, um, we've got some Daft Mill for you. Um, and basically, they hadn't forgotten that I'd shown interest and had really been keen on the place almost a decade ago, or maybe even more than a decade ago. And that's how that, that came about. Um, but that's, you know, relationships are so important to the best products that we have and the opportunities we have. And like, just like we, we really cherish the people who trust us putting our logo on things, we really cherish those relationships with the producers and uh, try to do their brands justice when we talk about them too. Um, but the last one, yeah, the boutique, which, and Rob, am I, I think I'm able, am I able to share my screen? Cause I just, I want to share the label shot for this thing okay, go for it if, if you can go for it I, i'm not sure you... well, we're going to give it a try we'll see if it we'll see if it works um but the reason i want to do that is um this whiskey is something i never thought that i'd be able to do um it really is uh and let's just see if this works here it's uh share screen i'll see if it lets me do that okay um can you see that is that coming through on your end so i don't see anything just yet here one sec here uh maybe i just have to break out the screen i got an idea here um so my family's from my mom's family is from uh northern scotland um let me see if I can show you. there we go i think this is how i do it okay mm -hmm. is that coming through Yeah, I just had to add it to the screen. Okay. So <clears throat> my mom's family is from the north of Scotland, from an area called Caithness in, in Sutherland. We were offered, offered a cask of Kleinlish that, that we just couldn't call Kleinlish by the Boutique Whiskey Company. Um, my friend Sam Simmons, Dr. Whiskey, um, is the, the head of whiskey there. You can see he and Dave Worthington in a, in a video we recorded. Um, when, when they offered us this cask, I, I approached Sam and said, hey, Sam, I have this idea. For the label, I think you're going to say no, but, you know, and I told him the story about my mom's family, who is my ancestors, cleared off the land to make way for sheep. The guy who did this opened the Kleinlish distillery. He was the worst practitioner of what were called the Highland Clearances. And when I first visited Scotland in 2005, um, I paid a visit to this monument. And here, I think I can zoom in a little bit on the label. And I, I'll be honest, I peed on it. Like I made sure no one was looking because I didn't want to get arrested, but I, I dropped trow and, and desecrated the monument. And I did it because this guy was a monster in history from, from the standpoint of Scottish peasants, which my, my ancestors were. And I thought for sure Sam was going to say no. And he actually emailed me a photo back showing himself and five buddies who had also climbed up the hill in 2005 and had also peed on the monument. And that's how this all came about. Um, Sam's originally from Toronto, so we're paying homage to our, our respective towns, the cowboy hats thrown in there, ship going to Canada, 
The cat in the clouds is the uh, is the wild Highland cat, which is Kleinlish's symbol. You can see there's sheep grazing on the valley floor, and uh, some of my staff in a balloon. There's a candle there. Even uh, this is Keith on the end. He's an Olympic coach for the national skeleton team. He's a bit of a, a beefcake of a guy. And uh, he wasn't happy with how his arm looked the first time around. So we had them Bugs Bunny it just for fun. Um, this is one of the coolest things I've been able to do. I never thought in my wildest dreams that they would ever um, be cool with us celebrating the desecration of a monument, but they were. But it also allowed me to tell a bit of my family history and, and how my mom's ancestors found their way to Nova Scotia. That's really cool. That's a really cool story. I didn't notice all those little details on the bottle, but I, <clears throat> I have seen the label before and I've anticipated buying it a few times and then just got sidetracked or whatever happened. But um, that's hilarious. <laughs> that well, whole story is amazing. We'll have it for a while. I mean, it was, it was a big run, 600 bottles. They're 500 mils too, which I think some people really struggle with. And, and it has that waxiness there, but it's not the Kleinlish style that people are probably familiar with. It's, it's funky. It's barnyardy, but in all the, the best possible ways. It's a cool whiskey that I'm really proud of. Um, I think probably the only thing that really stacks up with this on the cool factor for me is um, the bespoke blends that we did for our 25th anniversary with Compass Box and the one that we have coming because it's, a, it's not just a whiskey we selected. It's something that we actively participated in the process of creating and uh, – I mean, that, that, that to me, at the end of the day, I've been doing this now for, this is my 18, 19th year. I think it'll be my 19th anniversary in the fall. Um, this is still fun. I mean, and that's the best part about it for me. Um, it's a business, but I, 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 have fun. I get to have a lot of fun. It's awesome. Yeah. And honestly, it's, it says a lot about a job when it doesn't feel like a job because you love what you're doing, right? So that's that's awesome I, I mean that's what i think has made kwm so popular in canada especially because we can tell that you're a whiskey fan we we know that you're a whiskey fan you know and and that's not something that most retailers share you know what i mean that that's not really a, a common trait amongst people you're buying whiskey from right so mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you're a fan it's almost like we feel like you're, we're being taken care of a little bit more. You know what I mean? We, we, yeah. we feel like we don't have to worry as much if we buy, you know, definitely don't have to worry as much when we buy single casks and, and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, 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 if that's the prevailing view that I'm, I'm happy to hear because really, uh, you know, it, it, I can't ever get away from the fact that this is my livelihood and it's my, it's my business, but at the same time, I, I genuinely do enjoy doing it. I, I genuinely enjoy having fun. And I ho also hope people recognize that I'm not above poking fun at myself. I mean, we've done some Glenn Farkless labels where, you know, I'm, I look kind of silly on the label. And for me, that's part of the fun. Like, I just love being able to, to, to do something that's not just an, another boring, traditional looking label. Um, and yeah, these opportunities are great. If I can share one last thing, just because I'm—I mean, it's super cool. It's actually um, the label for our Compass Box one. Um, Rob, I don't know if you tried the one that we did a couple of years ago, um, the 25th anniversary one we had, but it was—I mean, the label was bespoke, but it wasn't really cool. Um, this time around, they've really allowed us to do uh, something truly bespoke, and they—they're paying homage to. Calgary, which is our home. And uh, I know I've got to click something here to allow this to come through, but- uh, It hasn't popped up on my end yet, so I'll add it as soon as I see it. Yeah, uh, let me find the photo. I'm pretty sure it's down here and then I'll, there we go. Um, one last one and then, uh, but uh, it's, uh, Compass Box is a brand that I have a lot, like Teeling, I have a ton of respect for what they did. and trying to really um, do something unique and different, but also, you know, really focused on quality and, and value. And uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, where is it here? I want to show a window. This is the label for our new 30th anniversary bottling that's coming. And 
I had a meeting with their design team and, uh, you know, I, I said I wanted to highlight the city and where we're from. And so they took kind of some of the buildings that are Calgary's famous for. Our tower, which I know Torontonians like to make fun of because it's very small, <laughs> uh, relatively speaking. But the mountains uh, are, are a part of it too. I mean, we're at the we're at the edge uh, the edge of the foothills, the, where the mountains start. And um, yeah, this things like this to me. Uh, I mean, they're they they add so much value to my 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 day to day and my career. Um, opportunities for you know collaboration and creativity that I, I really look forward to yeah i mean you guys are doing a great thing out there and and we across canada i can speak for a bunch of ontarians that i know and, and a, a bunch of friends i have that live across canada really love uh the single cast that you guys are popping out the fact that you guys um stay true to like you know what what the whiskey, whiskey geek wants they don't they want to they don't want to go uh, on a website and see uh, a bottle 17 times the price of regular retail and, and i'm not saying that that's never going to happen but i it's cool to see that you're doing your best not to make that happen so it i mean rob as long as i'm in charge it shouldn't uh you know we will take more margin on things that are rare because we know we can but we never do anything like that. And I know there are businesses that do. The, the reason we don't do that is, you know, it's a small industry and word gets around when you do that. And most of the producers don't like it when you do it either. Right. And uh, so, yeah, that's not something that I think you'll see. Um, you know, we're not perfect. We've made mistakes from time to time, but uh, you're not going to see us doubling the retail price on something just because we know people will pay it. Um, instead, what we'll do is we'll probably find a way to make sure that people who really want it and that deserve a chance to buy it, will we'll get a chance to buy it. Yeah. And that's awesome. And we respect that. And, and we've talked, like I said, we've talked about this on my channel at length. Um, Jeremy and I have, have spoken about it on the rant. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we do appreciate that and you're doing a great job out there. Is there anything that you want to, maybe there's a sale coming up or anything, um, mm -hmm. I know you guys did a really cool thing for the Ukraine uh, recently. I don't know if there's anything you want to speak to that's coming up at KWM that you can share. Yeah, um, our 30th anniversary is coming up in May. Um, for those in Calgary, we're going to do um, not very many, but we're going to do a couple of in-person events. I, I noticed there was the joke there about uh, doing a, a video of pissing on the guy's truck who crashed through the shop. Yeah, I mean... Uh, that, that's something that happened that's caused a bit of chaos that unfortunately will delay when we can do go back to doing things the way we did pre-COVID. But we're, we're going to have a couple of festivals in the shop in May. Um, we will have our annual birthday sale. But really, there's on top of that, we've got some really fun things coming. We even bought a family cask. I didn't think it would happen. Wow. But Glenn Farkless sent us a 1992 vintage, which is 92 is the year we opened. They sent us a family cast that we couldn't say no to. Um, so that's coming. The price is not as bad as you might think. It's not It's not cheap. It's a almost 30-year-old sherried single cast from Glenn Farkless, but um, that's coming. And, and yeah, we're just, you know, uh, there's a lot of fun things coming down the pipeline. Um, and, you know, if you haven't done it, and I realize, you know, now that COVID's over, a lot of people don't want to do the virtual thing. But if you're out of town, and you want to take part in one of our tastings like that's something that's always there um our sample kits find a way to wherever they need to get to and uh we we love that we've got people joining us from coast to coast some nights for our tastings yeah yeah i've, I've had an opportunity to do that as well it's a lot of fun um a lot of great stuff coming from your your shop so yeah keep doing the great work that you're doing and uh, i really appreciate you uh joining me tonight this was a lot of fun and you can tell you have a lot of fans uh just based on the chat tonight so that's that's got to be a good feeling for you as well yeah no and i, I mean I'm, I'm sure there's one or two people out there that don't like me either and you know one of the things i've learned is you, if you're doing a good job not everybody's going to think you're great and uh i just you know i i really i miss you know uh the days when i would travel and i think they'll come again when 
you know, I would do tastings for clubs in Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal and Quebec City and Vancouver, Victoria. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to going back and doing those because I love connecting with people and putting a face to the name for people we interact with on social media or on the phone or email. Well, the next time you are in Toronto, you are welcome to do a tasting uh, in this bar and sure. take anything from the shelf or bring anything you like. Uh, I think that will be a lot of fun as well. So, Sounds good, Rob. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you very much for, for having me on tonight and uh, for, for showcasing some of some of our bottles. Um, we're, we're really proud of them. And, you know, if you're if any of you are ever in Calgary, pop into the shop. I'm not always available. You know, it's surprising how busy you get running a small business. But I have some incredible whiskey people working for me that know in some cases more than I do about a lot of things. They've got good palates. And we've, we've got about 300 open bottles in the shop at any given time. Wow. So if you come in and my staff are trying to sell you something, chances are you can get a chance to try it. That's awesome. That's awesome to know, actually. Um, well, stay on the line. I want to I wanna say a formal goodbye to you. But uh, <laughs> for everybody that joined us tonight, thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, we had about 30 strong the whole night, so I really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. And uh, <clears throat> Kensington Wine Market is the store. You guys can find it on, uh, you know, just type it in Google. You'll find the website very quickly. It's in Alberta, Calgary to be specific. Um, again, thank you all for joining. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, everybody.